Hope everyone's doing well. Welcome to the Magia Mindset. Today's guest is a director of coaching at Ohio North, a professor at Ohio University, an p- instructor within the U.S. soccer coaching education. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome our guest, Dr. Tom Turner. Roll the intro. Tom, thank you so much for putting in the time to coming on the Magia Mindset. Um, I know, especially in this stage of the year, uh, in the club world, you having the door, uh, role as a director, an instructor within the licensing courses of USSF, as well as a professor within the master's program at Ohio, your hands are definitely full. So thank you so much for putting in the time and joining us on this podcast. Thank you, Sean. And, and you're right. It, it is literally at the end of the OU class. It's um, the end of o, uh, ODP with the State Association. It's the beginning of trying to get the coaching schools organized for the winter on a new format. Uh, it, it, it's an interesting time. <laughs> since, since we said that, Tom, I want to dive into kind of right now your role as an instructor within the the U.S. soccer courses, as well as um, our ma- the master's program as well. How have you as a professor having to adapt and adjust and be able to engage with your students and coaches during this time? The interesting thing about COVID is it's made Zoom a necessary evil. Um, I've done more Zoom stuff with the OU classes than than I ever did. Um, so we had three webinars in the OU class where instead of spending a lot of time writing the uh, assignments and then reviewing them, we did like a pre-review, a preview. So we got on, everybody who could make the webinar got on the webinar and, and then what you typically do with Zooms, you record them and people can watch them at their leisure and off you go. But it, it was a chance to add more depth to that course um, on the federation side and on the local side with the coaching ed, because Zoom was the the main um, vehicle to, to talk with people, um, it's actually, there's a lot of lessons learned from being on the Zooms. First of all, you get to see people if they turn their cameras on. And if they don't turn their cameras on, you're looking at a blank page. And depending on the number of people you've got on the Zoom the Zoomer, it can be a pretty lonely place. Um, so if you've got a group of people who are motivated and will participate, you can get by on a Zoom call. You can get things done. You can engage people if you call the quiet people out and they respond. But I would imagine there's going to be scenarios where if you're sitting on a Zoom call and people don't respond, it's going to be a lonely place. And at that point, you end up talking to yourself. Um, that's not education, that's not interaction. Unless people are interacting, you don't have an exchange of ideas, you just got a monologue. Um, The other thing clearly about the the Zoomer piece, that there's nothing like being together where you can exchange ideas, you look at body language, you can can sense things in a group that you can't sense on a Zoomer. So when you're sitting there with 12 people or 14 people or 20 people or whatever, all you see is faces. You don't see body language. You don't see the rest of us, and I'm guilty as anybody else. We're in there playing with email or checking something here or there. There's just not the interaction you get when you're in a room together, and certainly there's no re- interaction when you're on the field, but you, you can get a lot out of being on the field, sorry, watching somebody's video of them coaching. You, you, there's no question you can get a lot of mileage even a distance learning um, situation where, where people are sending videos in and you're talking to folk about videos. There's, that, that is probably one of the most underutilized um, assessment tools in, uh, ever. Um, there's so much to get out of video, but Zoomers themselves, they're necessary. I think it's more convenient for people because you can stay at home. COVID's brought it 
front and centre and it's not going to go away and probably for cost and uh, convenience for some people it's going to be great there's going to be a loss of quality um, so here's here's where we are welcome to COVID 2000 <laughs> <laughs> unique time um, on the educational aspect um, you've been in the US uh, for a good amount of time I want to know and talk to you how have you seen the evolution of coaching education? Obviously, the uh, coaching education is a good uh, ripple effect that, you know, obviously as it's growing, then your players become better. The more they know, the more the coaches know, the more the players will know in those environments. Right. How have you seen that growth of evolution within your time in America? Let me start at where the ideal would be. And, and the ideal for, for me is that, let's just say you planned a coaching education program around game forms. So somebody came in and they started at five a side game and then they went to a seven a side game and a nine a side game and an 11 a side game. And instead of looking at it by age, you look at it by game form. And clearly there's an issue between coaching adults at seven a side and nine-year-olds at seven aside because that what they bring to the game is completely different. But as far as coaching head goes, I think we've got a huge lack of understanding of what people are looking for in a game. So if you play a five-a-side game, your, your side needs width, your side needs depth. You've got to keep balance within the lines. You've got to find moments to go forward. You've got to find moments to keep the ball. You've got the attacking, defending, transition moments. You're building from one half. You're defending in another. Th those never change. So when you move from one game form to the next game form, all you get is more complicated in terms of the numbers. But the basic principles are still the same. So whatever your your the, the new word is the team tactical principles, but what are the ideas that you want your team to to think about? Those don't change either. You still have to come up with a thought that says, look, if you get in this situation as the coach, I would like you to think about this. Play away from pressure. Run into space. Um, move the ball quickly. Whatever your ideals are, whatever your identity is, that doesn't change whether you're coaching 5, 7, 9, 11, 15 a side. So in an ideal world, more people would start off with what's the context of a soccer game when you put two teams on the field and you try to play a competitive game. All right, so going back to where we've come from, U.S. soccer, to their credit, has, with the play practice play piece, put the game more in focus because for, for decades, I've been here 42 years, and just in case anybody's counting, um, I learned all my coaching education on this side. I would say I probably learned how to play on this side, but my formation in the game and the passion and all of those things that still endure started off in the first 18 years. Many, in fact, all of which were devoid of any coaching at all, period. That's interesting by itself. So if we go back to where the coaching ed pieces are, uh, come from. We used to have practices for technique and practices for tactics. Then we had functional training pieces. Um, we've talked about the game in terms of whole part whole, which is a, a cousin of um, play practice play. Um, you had to get to the higher levels before you actually started looking at the game in a context of a game. And there's two teams playing. How do you line the teams up? What's the formation? What's the roles? Um, what are your tactical ideas, what's your style, what's your identity, that was only something you got later on. So if every, the masses who came in at the bottom, you didn't actually give them a sense of here's what the game is. Just uh, as a basic idea, here's what the game looks like. You play it different from the next coach and the next coach, but the game is still the game. At some point, you have to play with people on the side. At some point, you have to play with people in the front. At some point, you have to get those people to understand how to play together and keep a balance within your team. If the kids can't play in organized formations, don't put them in numbers that require you to put them in spaces. Just put them on the game, on the field, and let them run around and find spaces and hopefully get away from each other. 
okay, that's the layer below formal positional play. So the, the, the coaching ed piece over the years has evolved and it's gotten more game-like because we, we realize as a country we don't have enough people who will naturally go play. And it's amazing how quickly you can get young kids to just go organize teams and play. But the coaching ed piece is still, it's still in many ways reliant on the one element that is not front and center, which is when you look at a five-a-side or a six-a-side or a seven-a-side game, what do you see? And then work back in so that you can organize. If you want to take some little piece of that game and you don't know what the bigger game looks like, how are you supposed to organize the little pieces when you start taking, well, I'll just work with the front half or I'll just work with the back half? And you don't have a context of what the whole piece looks like. Well, guess what? It, it, it progress is slower than everybody wants it to be. So it, it's, that's a challenge. It's become a lot more holistic um, in that the message is a lot more about looking at the game as a game. It's not about training fitness. It's not about training technique. It's not about training uh, bits and pieces in isolation. But the other side of that is there, there are still times where it does make sense to train some pieces of the game aside from the game. Holistic works. I'll, I'll give you this analogy. If we went into, a, if we formed a band, what we would do when we formed the band is that you might be playing the bass and I'll play the guitar because I've got the guitar back here. And we would go and we say, well, what can we play? And we would always play within the context of a song. And we would practice playing the music to get better at the song. Your job is to go home and get your, your bass lines improved. My job is to go home and make my guitar pieces improved. And when we come together, we sound better collectively. And what happens in the soccer world is I think we come into soccer practice and I'm still teaching you how to play, play the bass and so teaching you how to play the guitar. So we never actually spend enough time learning the music, which ultimately motivates us to go back and practice on our own. I don't think the individual practice is as fun as playing the game, and every kid will probably tell you that. But it, I think philosophically and conceptually, we've got this thing upside down. Start with a game and encourage people to go train so that they develop the individual pieces. And, and you want to play practice play piece. I think it's trying to get to that. If they want more play in the soccer practice. Okay. Totally agree. Now let, let's do a better job with it. No, that's, that's fantastic. And it segues to my next part in how we talked about education and now creating that formula of philosophy, coaching style within, let's say, if you have a football or soccer school or in America, we have a football soccer club and you're in charge of the whole thing from the top to bottom. OK, meaning if if you want. What's the age of entry? Should it be no restriction if they want to come and play at two? Do we have. Uh, a youth fun kids academy what would be the setup for the grassroots we can say so on what's the entry of that then the next phase what should be a properly next phase with that part and then finally the last pipeline is the senior showcase and what should be their aspiration in america it's mainly universities if so so they make professional i know in the international parts, they are affiliated to a professional thing to be able to have that opportunity to get there. My whole thing is to create, let's say, whatever that vision is in coaching style, what are we really promoting? But what, what age should it start with? And what should be the concept from phase to phase as progression happens to promote the game as maybe let's just say, Tom, in your in your perception of how you feel the game should be promoted. Interesting question. Um, I asked my dad once, when did I start playing on the streets? And he said, probably about the time you went to school. So that, that's sort of my marker. We started playing organized, no adult soccer at age five, organized probably by the six-year-olds and the seven-year-olds. And it was just free play, no coaching. I literally did not have a coach who knew anything about the game other than just a brief 
moment here and there until they get to college in Cleveland. So there are people who are fantastic with little three and four year olds. And it's probably three and four year olds and one ball and one adult. <laughs> um, I don't want to go anywhere near three and four year olds with one ball and one adult because there are things that even intimidate me. Um, uh, I don't, and, and this is probably a sad o o omission or, or admission, but uh, the top soccer group the same way. Uh, I feel I should know more about what top soccer is as part of structure because there are top soccer kids and, and families and part of clubs. And just because of my career, I haven't gotten uh, to spend enough time and get experience with that population. But anyway, so at the bottom, the question to me is, can you get them at least to move? And this comes back to the basic premise, and it's probably the thread that runs through all of the answer, which is the motivation of the players, not the motivation of the parents. So if you've got a motivated kid who will at least engage in the game, then you can start soccer. What? soccer is I don't know but I'm, I'm going to be talking more about six and seven year olds than three and four and five year olds to me they're they're it's kind of a different uh, structure within a club or within a within the a soccer organization and frankly I don't have any experience with it and then I'll just leave it at that so the u sixes u eights you bring them into the club if they've got motivation you can do a lot of things. You can do a lot of things that set the table for what the goal is at the end of their soccer experience. First and foremost, to me, you want them to be dribblers. If you can't dribble a soccer ball, you're done, period. Okay, so, so that's that's the first thought, is that the thread that will run through the club is to make people comfortable with the ball, which means smaller numbers, lots of repetitions, lots of freedom to experiment, um, there's no real coaching that goes on at the young ages, obviously. It's a lot more about just putting them in environments that they can they can see and solve. And that's maybe the biggest difference is people bring the entry-level kids in and they, they teach them things. You may, but you're going to do it in quickly. You're not going to tell them, here's a technical piece that works and try this, because they don't, they don't get that. But you can get them to practice turning away from people simply by chasing them. Okay? Um, the other piece of the club structure maybe that makes sense is if you look at a developmental pyramid, and pyramid is not the right word, continuum, you get kids who come in who are very self-centered and they'll dribble the ball and you can encourage kids to pass the ball. Then you can encourage kids to get away from each other and then you can encourage kids to stay and find some sort of a shape which leads you then to team building, positional understanding, and, and that whole track. But the foundation of that, and at some point I've got enough time and space to pick my head up and pass to you. You've got enough awareness not to stand two feet from me so that the pass doesn't get defended by the other people who are around you. So the entry level piece, there's a couple of components to it. Is, is one, it's got to be small enough numbers that the kids have got time and space. If they want to just dribble it and beat everybody, go for it. If they can pass the ball, that's great. Here's another twist to this. When I started off as a five-year-old, it was the six and seven-year-olds that helped us understand the game. So what do we do? We put all the four-year-olds together, all the five-year-olds together, all the six-year-olds together, and wonder why they've got no idea what they're doing. So what I literally do every Sunday morning in the fall and the spring, I just got done last Sunday, is you put the adults in the goal. And you have the older siblings come up and they'll play. You want to see seven, six and seven-year-olds think about moving, think about passing? Put the older, the, the scaffolding with them, and then you see them do things that they would never do on their own. You look at a seven-year-old before I get the ball, and the seven-year-old's already running into the space, and I just turn around and play the ball into the set. That's a three-player combination. You think that's going to happen by teaching? That's just within those natural things that you develop habits because that's what they do. They don't need to know why they're doing them. But that foundational piece is so screwed up because we've got it so formalized. And in an ideal world, you wouldn't have competition that didn't include numbers that they couldn't make sense of. It would have multiple ages playing together, even if it's two years. That's okay. 
you could find ways to get the adults uh, who can play as the role models within the game. And then the motivation of the kids is going to tell you which ones go into a more intensive track and which ones stay just playing the game for the fun of playing the game. Because those might be the ones who don't really care, but will stay in the game. And maybe even through high school where the quote unquote better kids go off, you might have another group that's two, three, four times that size who are still playing, but they don't want to play high school. So we cut, that was a message from um, uh, Green, um, Game On, Tom Ferry. He talked a lot about when you come to high school and the kids realize they're not going to make it, they quit. We should have a parallel programs so that those kids can go find their level just to enjoy the game and not have to worry about, oh, I'll make a high school team, I'm not good enough, done. So we, we, we have a lot of we, we have a lot of components to what we have in soccer that excludes kids either directly or just in terms of their motivation, doesn't give them a place to stay with it. It's easy enough when you get the motivated kids, right? We know what that looks like, but it's the unmotivated kids who may be the mass that we're, we're completely missing the boat on. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it's certainly some of the pieces. No, it does. It does. And it's fascinating how you even um, touch point on the emotional aspect. And one of the things I wanted to get into was I read a quote from um, Alex Ferguson and a couple of the veteran um, Man United players um, when Cristiano Ronaldo was obviously getting started in his first his first few years. It was, it was really rough for him. And yep. even as a coach, um, Sir Alex Ferguson was like, I had to learn how to adapt to a coach that individual Cristiano because he was so emotional. Meaning that when when you told him that, hey, you're never going to get anywhere if you keep holding on to the ball, you're never going to be. And to for him, he was literally went into the locker room, started crying, and emotionally he was broken by it. And some of the players had to say, you know what? If we want to get the best from this player, Alex even said, I have to treat him like my son. I got to care for him. The players were like, they have to keep being positive with him. There shouldn't be no negatives and adapting. I know that's on a professional level, but now today, even at the youth level, at every level, I think it's a very important part that every individual, not technical part, but we can even say the number 10s or something, are having to take a different approach you know you having to emotionally as a coach how do you push their buttons you know is it uh, a kick right behind or is it arm around the shoulder is it constant positive or you have to mix it in with the negative uh, if we can get into the psychological part of a coach uh, and how you manipulate environments to maximize performance of your players so that, that goes over a wide range and then there's a range of skills that are different to every level. Maybe the fundamental piece is that probably 99.7 of the people you have to respect as people. And there's another thought that always goes through whenever my mouth starts to open and I start to swear under my breath, <laughs> which is that's probably the best they could do at the time. What did they do next? So when you make a bad pass and you give it away, it happens at the pro level every Saturday when we watch it. it. We're going to give the ball away, but what did you do next? Did you just recover? And are you expecting to hear abuse in your ear, which then gets you in another mental state that's not connected with, just go back and try to defend. So if you deal with every good faith effort as the best they can do at the time. It also is a check for understanding at the time. So it's a lot more encouraging for someone to get an at a boy or at a girl or it's okay. Just respond to the game. We're, we are all going to make mistakes. Respond to the game. And then we look at what's the trends in those mistakes? Is somebody not reading a tactical cue? How can I help them? So here's an example from an eight-year, a seven-year-old on Sunday. 
little seven-year-old was getting in front of the goal and I was the goalkeeper and she was passing the ball to the older kid. So it comes back now to that whole roadmap conversation. What's the objective in the game? Pass the ball? Is that how we win the game? She said, I said, how do you win the game? She says, basically came down to scoring goals or passing the ball. And I said, okay, if you have 10 goals or 10 passes at the end of the game, who wins? 10 goals. Okay. So when you're in front of the goal, the better to shoot the ball or pass the ball if, if, if the goal's in front of you. Clearly she got, because she was a bright little girl, and she said, oh, shoot the ball. So surprise, surprise, next time she gets in the same situation, she shoots the ball and she scores, because I made sure I jumped out of the way, right? So she scores. So now the reinforcement is there. Let's fast forward to, um, I don't know, high school kids. Now you got to look at their skill set. you got to look at their mentality. What level do they play at? Um, you still got people. You can have a deeper conversation, but ultimately it's not you screwed up, therefore you're a bad person. It's how can I help you, but we can have an interaction that's a lot deeper than the one I just had with a seven-year-old, but it's still ultimately the framework of the game is still the same. The way that you deal with people is deeper as they get older and they've got more ability to respond to you and they can have an interaction with you that says, this is what I'm feeling, this is what I'm reading. And then my job is to try to help them overcome either by training and practice or if it's just a self-doubt thing then we have to do things off the field that just make them feel comfortable and and that's frankly an ongoing challenge for all of us that there's experts and then there's people who just dab in it dabble in it and I don't deal enough anymore with the older kids I don't deal with teams day-to-day -day basis I don't deal with college day-to-day -day basis um I don't know whether I'd be better or worse than I was before, given the fact that I've had 20 years experience in between my last team coaching. I don't know, but it'd be fun and I'm going to try at some point when I, when I get to retirement age, I'm going to go back coach teams just to see what that, that feels like. But it's, that's, that's the basis of the game. The basis of the game is the psychology and the relationship between the coach and the players and the players and the players and how they deal with adversity, how they deal with success, how we deal with their own, places on the team uh, and ultimately it's not necessarily a success in terms of results it's a success in terms of did it, was this a good experience if you walk away and it's been a good experience you're likely to come back you might go 10 and 0 and have a horrible experience and not come back well clearly you'd rather have the, the latter or the former you, you, you just need the team chemistry thing is something i was horrible at as a college coach and i've gotten much more aware of how to be better at it, but I don't have the experience in a practical way to see if it actually works. If that makes sense. <laughs> it, it does. It does. If I was planning my personal development plan for that, it would definitely be the psychology of team building would probably be up there with, that would be at the top of the list. Is how do I get better at that? Yeah. And, and since we're on that too, you know, I think a lot of um, anything, not only football, as a player, as a coach, anything in, in life, to be successful, a lot of the percentage starts from the neck up. I think <laughs> it's that mindset you got to have right between your ears. Um, and that's one of the, the main talking point on this podcast. It's the mindset. It's the mindset. And Tom, you, you uh, being around players that are going up the ladder, you being next to coaches that are at the highest level, where in, in the in the U.S. that we're at, internationally where we're at, um, I want to talk about what are the qualities that these elite individuals have, you know, like yourself, like other individuals, like football players that are at the highest level, coaches that are at the highest level, people that are on the front office at the highest level. What is it that mentally they have that got them to that? Uh, if we can kind of uh, dive into that. That's really a fascinating study for me because as a player, I don't think I had a mindset to ever maximize whatever potential I had because there was always a feeling of self-doubt. And I'll tie these together in a minute. And I don't think I would have been a successful coach at the highest level because of the same mentality I think at some point in the coaches, you change and you go into games and you look at it and it changes from we're playing a good team 
I hope we do okay. And it changes to the point where you say, I'm playing a good team. How do we find ways to win that game? And, and so that, that changes, I think, with experience of being able to manage a team, you get much more of an a, aggressive mindset. But ultimately, the players who, like a, a Rose Lavelle, or um, uh, I'm thinking of the guy who was at Fulham uh, from Texas, Clint, Clint Dempsey. You get people like that who you hear stories about. Um, Carly Lloyd, who are incredibly... April Heinrichs, probably the best example. I can't get into their heads because I don't understand their mindset, right? Are the elite athletes, a lot of people with that kind of mindset that are so driven that you have to have a completely different way to deal with it? I don't know that, right? Is it Alex Ferguson, the way he was because of the way he thought about life and the people he put around him to compensate for what he didn't know and to help him build the club in ways that he couldn't without help. So when you look at these elite players, I think you even see it with the little kids because, because I'm fascinated by this. I watch these six and seven year olds and there are kids who are just bruisers, right? They don't care if they bowl anybody over. And then the kids who show up first, they'll play. Are those the kids like the Dempsey's and the Lavelle's and the Lloyd's and the, and the Heinrich's and people like that? Because they're separate. Their mindset is so focused on max. They're not even maximizing. They just want to go win. They just do what they need to do to win. They're, they're on all the time. Are pro clubs, is one matter like that? Probably not. He owns a restaurant. He's probably a chef in the background too. So I don't know. So there's clearly examples of people who don't necessarily have that same kind of killer instinct, but there's probably a lot more who do. Um, I don't live in that world. I, I, I'd be lying if I said I, I knew what that was in reality. I think I look at it from afar and try to study it as best I can because I think I'm not sure personality type changes that much between what you see at the younger levels and what you see with the people who make it to the top. That there's there's a connection there because we, we tend to be wired the way we're wired. And and for sure you can change to some degree, but the fundamental wiring in these people is pretty much set. You know, you're not going to turn somebody who's an absolute animal as a as a seven-year-old. No, that's the wrong way to look at it. Are you going to turn someone who's completely passive into someone who's completely aggressive by the time they get older? You can be a better defender. You can be more um, better tackler. You're going to take more risks in tackles. But if your head says, I might get hurt, does Juan Mata ever stick his head in where it might get kicked off? Maybe not. <laughs> it, it's, it's really it's fascinating. But I also think I'm, I study that at the younger ages because I'm seeing personality traits with young kids that I think those are the kids who are going to be different. Those are the kids who are going to go take the game further. Those are the kids that you can say, put a thought in their ear and maybe they'll listen. And if they don't listen this year, maybe it's next year, but that's part of the psychology of coaching is if you say something to a kid and they just don't want to know, you're not going to force it. You just have to wait for the next moment or until the light goes on and they say, I want to know something and they come to us or you drop the penny and they listen. It can make sense to them at some point. But in terms of the, at the top end, I don't know, but the, the people with a mentality, you can tell, and they're different. They just are. No, that's, that's amazing. Uh, one of the things we like to conclude uh, the podcast with is we'd like to have a little fun, uh, fun questions. <laughs> um, and it's, it's a two-part question. Uh, it's basically, what is your favorite team of all time? And it can be in any sports uh, because we wanted to kind of relate to you of how you grew up. And the reason we say any sports is because uh, depending on an experience, we want you to elaborate. Why is that so significant to you? Uh, and then second would be who's your favorite player of all time? Again, it can be any athlete. Um, so it gives you the room to elaborate. So a lot of people, because uh, it started the sport for them, 
Um, right. It started a certain love for athletics for them. So that's what we want to kind of get to, allows us to get to know you better too. All right. I'm going to go with the 1973 Glasgow Rangers team. Mm. Okay. So I grew up in an area where Celtic, which is the other big club in Scotland, won just about everything for a long time under a guy called Jock Steen. And I actually met the guy, asked me to sign Celtic just before I came over to, to, to Cleveland. Um, so tremendous respect for the team, a grudging respect, but it was still Celtic. <laughs> so the 73 Cup final on seven. Well, excuse me for the printer's going, my wife is printing something from downstairs. Um, we get tickets to the cup final and Rangers are playing Celtic and it's at Hamden Park and there's 130,000 people at Hamden Park. And it was the first experience of a quote-unquote big game. There's 130,000 people at the game and I'm 13 years old. And Celtic scored first. And in, in those days, like they probably, well, they still are today, the, the, the stadium was halved. Blue was over here, blink green was over there. And this end goes silent, and this roar just comes across the field and in under the, the enclosure. And you hear this kind of boom coming from the other side. And it was that first moment where you realize the passion that was involved in the sport firsthand. You can see it on TV all, all the time, and I'm 13 years old. And I'm experiencing this. And there's absolute bedlam and delirium when, when Rangers score. And eventually they won 3-2. And that was the first time they'd sort of started to turn the tide. But just the experience of being in that and the passion of it and walking away with it. The, the, in those days, the stadium was dirt and the terraces were built with wooden slats. So there was a wooden slat and then dirt packed it in and wooden slat and dirt packed it in. And it was a hot day and the dust was flying up. So I was digging dust out of my nose and my ears for like the next day. Um, and you're deaf because of the noise. You're hoarse because you've been singing. Most of the time you have no idea why you're singing or what you're singing, but you're singing. But that lived with me. So now you, that's the 13-year-old click. I love this game. <laughs> And I always loved it as a player, but now you're getting, you're, you're in as, you're bitten as a fan. You can't get away from that. Um, so that was the favourite team. Uh, the favourite, I love people like Tiger Woods, Bjorn Bork, um, Bjorn Bork, excuse me, um, McEnroe. Um, and it's kind of funny because they're, Jordan, those are all people with that mentality I was talking about before, come to think of it. Um, I also like the, the, the Chrissy Everett's of the world who were, were very sporting in the way they, they played. And there's probably a few more examples of people who, who would play the game, um, well, something like a Danny McGrain who you don't know or... or He's a Celtic player, but he was he was one of these people who was tough but sporting. You know, you, you fall over, you pick you up. Lineker from England. Um, just just people who have a, a competitive side to them. And then secondly, I think on the other extreme, people who respect the sport and respect their opponents. So I, I think I, I, there, there's athletes who you can't but not admire because of their absolute sheer talent. Um, and those are individual or team sports, but just Ronaldo clearly is, is one. But but that's the one side of it. Uh, and I think I respect the people who are combative, competitive, but also respect maybe that sport isn't everything. And if I kick somebody, I'm going to pick them up because I probably didn't really mean to do that. Um you know, the teams that applauded winning teams onto a field because they had celebrated a championship. That, that to me, is the sort of um, the ideal of the sport, is that you have to respect the sport. You have to respect sometimes people are better than you uh, and, and don't look at it as an affront. You look at it as um, a welcome chance to compete and maybe just test yourself against people who are better, and sometimes you aren't. So that that would be the two types I'm, I'm Names is a little bit tougher. No, 
That's great. That's brilliant. Um, Tom, again, it's been fantastic. I truly appreciate it um, putting in the time. Uh, what we like to do with the guests is um, we like the guests to close us out with anything they got going on in the, the world of soccer, world of football. So from our audiences, if they, they, they want to grow to help the game grow, uh, what they can kind of follow along, if it's projects you have going on within the game, within your own club, uh, and they can kind of link into programs that you're in charge with that are great programs for aspiring coaches uh, and um, players that should kind of link into because it helps them become better and it helps our game become better. All right, so i got to tell you about the, the big news in Ohio is that Ohio North and Ohio South uh, will be officially merged by the 1st of December and become um, the 55 state associations will become 54. Uh, so we're absolutely excited about that because it, it gives us so many opportunities. There's two professional teams in the state. Um, we, we've got all sorts of plans that it might we might be gone and retired by the time some of them get started, but, but that's on the horizon for us and we're just pumped about that. Um, as far as for coaches, COVID's clearly changed our world. Um, the coaching education piece in particular is going to be different. We're all going to be sitting on Zoomers like this. Um, it's going to put a lot more onus on people being a little bit more self-driven, a little bit more disciplined. Um, people will still be able to come in and probably pass a course but will you get the most out of it? And it's going to put a lot more of the responsibility on the other side of the Zoom so that the people who are signing up for a course, if they're signing up for the reasons that I'm trying to improve myself, they, they literally are going to have to do most of the heavy lifting to make that happen because we're not going to get together. We're not going to have the same experiences we had before. And the people who are just checking the boxes will probably still check the boxes. The people who... Are, are looking to move themselves along in terms of the different responsibilities of a coach. They'll probably get along further, maybe not, maybe not faster, but they'll get along further because they've got an attitude that says, I'm trying to help myself. So maybe with a coaching ed piece, that's, that's just our reality for the foreseeable future. That's, that's great. That's great. Again, thank you so much, Tom. My pleasure. Great seeing you again, Sean.